Now, without any further delay, let's begin today's event. Once again, Defend Against Check Fraud with e-signatures and signature verification. Sponsored by COFAX and hosted by American Banker. I would like to introduce your moderator for today, and that is Mike Fisk. Mike, you now have the floor. Thanks very much, Christina, and I would like to welcome the audience once again. I see that we have a very international group today with representatives from uh, more than 30 countries, so thank you all for joining. Uh, we very much appreciate that you've chosen to share some of your busy day with us. We know that your time is valuable, and we will honor that today with what I'm confident will be an enlightening 60 minutes or so of discussion. Once again, our topic today is Defend Against Check Fraud with e-signatures and signature verification. And um, my name is Michael Sisk. I'll be your moderator today. I've been a New York-based journalist for about 20 years, and I've had stints as investor editor at Red Herring and editor at large at U.S. Banker. My articles have also appeared in Barron's, Crane's New York Business, Inc., Institutional Investor, Strategy and Business, and Worth. However, more important than my background are those of our two excellent speakers who I'm very pleased to introduce to you now. The first is Dennis D'Ambrosio. Dennis is a senior professional services consultant and fraud subject matter expert with, folk, with COFAX. He spent 18 years in fraud risk management with a $135 billion multi-regional bank. He was a stakeholder in numerous fraud initiatives with extensive experience in fraud strategy development and operational risk management. His areas of expertise include check, wire, ACH, ATM, mobile, RDC, online banking, identity fraud, account takeover, elder financial abuse, and internal fraud. He is credited with saving the bank millions annually by deploying and managing fraud strategies across multiple payment channels. And we're very, very pleased to have Dennis with us today. And th joining Dennis is Jörg Lenz. Jörg is product manager, product marketing manager at Kofax based in Germany. He has 17 years of experience in digital transformation and a deep understanding of e-signature and payment processes. He was and is heavily involved in the evolution of the corresponding products COFAX SignDoc for e-signing and COFAX Fraud 1 for check fraud prevention. Your, your facilitates the synergies of those signature products with other Lexmark solutions as well as with partners integrating SignDoc or Fraud 1 into their solutions. And we're also very, very pleased to have your with us today. So, um, and now just before we jump into the real uh, meat of the discussion here, I wanted to reiterate a couple of uh, housekeeping notes that uh, Christina mentioned at the top. We do have time at the end for Q&A, so um, we usually have about 10 minutes or so. So pl please um, feel free to put your questions into the queue as they occur to you throughout the hour. We, um, you do not have to wait until the end to put your questions in. And if we run out of time uh, and don't get your question, which sometimes happens when we've got lots of great content, um, we will follow up afterward. So please, um, uh, if we don't answer your question with the, in the time we have today, we will follow up with you. We really would love to hear, you, hear from you, so please ask away. Um, and we also have a couple of polls today. I always encourage 100% participation whenever possible. We do share the results uh, live with everyone here today, and it's usually just a great way to um, level set, see where everyone else stands on the issue that we've come together to discuss. So um, if you can participate in the polls, please do. And I think that kind of brings me to the end of my little opening spiel. I will be back to run some polls in a little bit. But in the meantime, I would love to turn things over to Dennis. Dennis, please, take it away. All right, Mike, thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction as well. So here are a few of the topics we'll be discussing today. Are checks still relevant? What are some of the current fraud trends we're seeing? We'll talk about check fraud prevention. We'll look at e-signature and using e-signature for fraud prevention. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about the ROI of a check fraud solution. So are checks still re relevant? Absolutely. More than 12 billion checks were cut in the U.S. in 2015. And over half a billion checks were issued in the U.K. and Canada. The U.S. differs from a lot of developed countries in that paper checks are still used in large part uh, for business-to-business -business transactions. And although the number of paper checks is declining, they still account for a large portion of the total number of transactions and are still valued as a convenient source of payment. 
as the UK Payment Council put it, they will be kept as long as customers need them. This is one of the reasons checks are a predominant target of fraud transactions. Another reason checks are subject to fraud is that the physical items can be easily altered. As well, readily available technology has truly simplified the counterfeiting of checks. And as a result, checks continue to account for a major uh, majority of fraud activity. This is one example of more than a half million cases of check fraud in the U.S. every year. In March of 2016, Ms. Laguza of Pembroke Park, Florida, called her local TV station for help when she became the victim of check fraud. She had a bad check valued at $2,395 cash with a forged signature, the story we've heard before. While the bank likely reimbursed her, it undermines the customer confidence in the payment system. In reality, most check fraud cases never make the news, particularly when it involves business customers. It's not good for business. Check fraud is an ongoing battle against a largely unknown group of both organized and unorganized individuals. The fraudsters pursue the path of least resistance by testing controls and exploiting gaps. Checks continue to be the payment method most targeted by fraudsters, according to AFP Payment Fraud and Control Survey, published in March of 2016. 90% of the responders reported the same or increased check fraud incidents year over year. This is the same feedback we receive from our customers on the prevalence of check fraud incidents. Despite declines in check fraud usage and expedited presentment, the risks associated with check fraud have not dissipated. While some banks have tightened security around other payment channels, like card and online channels, they haven't paid much attention to checks as they were hoping that check usage would decline much faster. So the check fraud types we're focusing on today involve return deposited items, forgeries, counterfeits, and alterations. The majority, major types of check fraud involve counterfeit, forgery, and returned items. When we look at those types, we see that 88% fall into these categories. Counterfeits and forgeries make up 53% of the overall fraud, and this has been relatively consistent for quite a number of years. The ABA has been tracking check fraud for over 20 years now. The most recent ABA deposit account fraud survey was published in January of 2016 and was based on responses from over 100 banks of all sizes. Looking at some of the highlights from this report, we see there are over 565,000 cases per year. That's more than 1,500 cases in the U.S. every day, which undermines the trust and security of payment processing. The total number of fraud cases increased 19% compared to the previous report from 2012. That's over 90,000 cases. The average loss per case was $1,087 but for super regional money centers, it was eight times higher. The total loss for the industry was $615 million in 2014, with over $6 billion in loss avoidance by check fraud mechanisms like Fraud One. So where are we losing the money? Well, currently two-thirds of the loss originates from over-the-counter items 
due in part to competing objectives to provide positive customer experiences and the need for real-time fraud controls. Secondly, as banks continue to see customers adopt mobile-friendly applications, we can expect losses attributed to remote deposit capture to continue to grow in the future. Looking at remote deposit capture, the Deposit Anywhere convenience offered by Mobile RGC has contributed to its rapid adoption and rapid growth and fraud. It's really become a customer expectation. As a result of significant growth in check fraud attempts, was reported for consumer accounts between 2012 and 2014, due in part to the increased acceptance of mobile deposits, coupled with faster funds availability. Banking is a 24-7 environment, and fraud groups are among the fastest adopters of new technology. Mobile banking has globalized fraud opportunities like never before. Some of the common pain points most frequently expressed by banks when discussing fraud one are the needle and haystack burden, high processing costs, staff resource limitations, limited decision and audit trails, loss risk, and the lack of flexibility to respond to changing patterns or bursts in fraud. These and other things, these and others may be what keep you awake at night. So what have banks done so far? Typical bank strategies for dealing with check fraud consist of simple processing rules and or a set of behavioral pattern checks supplemented by a team of check reviewers or fraud analysts. The strategy has limitations. Simple rules can yield high review volumes and high false positive rates, making it inefficient. It's akin to judging a book based on the cover alone. So now we have our first polling question that I'd like you to provide some feedback on. So if you take a look at your screen, you'll see we have that up there and you can um, select the most appropriate one. But what check fraud prevention measures do you currently employ? Dennis, if you want, I can jump in real quick. Um, and these are these are the polls. The first of three polls that I that I promised that we will be showing the audience. Um, so let me go ahead and read. Just I'll read to the, it's the, the the question is what check fraud prevention measures do you employ? And let me read through the questions here. I mean the I mean the possible answers to this question. And hopefully by that time everyone will have had enough time to make a choice. So we manually verify a random sample of the submitted checks. We manually verify all checks over a certain value. We verify based on simple serial and amount fraud rules. We have an automated check verification solution based on image analysis that verifies all checks, or we don't currently have a fraud prevention measure. So once again, the question is, what check fraud prevention measures do you employ? <coughs> and let me, I said it's probably, everyone's probably had a, enough time now to, to make a selection on this, so let me go ahead and share the results with everyone here. And uh, there we go. So almost half of you said we manually verify all checks over a certain value. Um, and that was uh, followed by we have an automated check verification solution based on image analysis that verifies all checks. About 20% of you um, uh, n uh, chose that one. So thank you. That's interesting. And I just I want we've got two polls in a row here. So I'm going to go ahead and just run us right into this next poll. And this one is, what has been your company's experience with check fraud losses over the past three years? And once again, I'll just read through the answers here, and everyone can uh, take a moment to make a selection. Check fraud numbers have decreased. 
check fraud numbers have remained the same. Check fraud has increased due to traditional check fraud, or check fraud has increased due to remote deposit capture. So let me give everyone just another moment or two to answer that question. And then we'll share, and we'll be off to the races with the remainder of our program. Okay, let me go ahead and share. And here we go. So pretty well, so check fraud numbers have remained the same. About 37% of you said that. Um, check fraud has increased due to traditional check fraud, 26%. And 24.5 of you said check fraud has increased due to remote deposit capture. So interesting results. Um, and and uh, let me just uh, ask Dennis really quickly, um, any thoughts on these um, last two polls, anything that you thought was particularly uh, surprising, or were they mostly the results mostly in line with what you were expecting? Uh, they they weren't quite in line with what I was expecting. I'd say we definitely see that the need to verify checks is still a necessity. It's something our customers expect or your customers expect. Um, but we see that there's there's really not a lot of diminished uh, diminished or decreased check fraud out there. In fact, what is it? Uh, just under 90% of the responders have either seen an increase or the same level of check fraud. Over 50% saw an increase. So it's not a trend that's going away anytime soon. As long as that, that payment channel is available, you're going to see fraud in it. So it, it just resounded what I was expecting. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Um, all right, good. So that actually brings us to um, your uh, portion of the program. So let me officially transfer things over to you, York. Please take it away. Yeah, thanks uh, to everyone participating in the polls from my end as well. That sort of insight is a little bit similar to industry numbers we are receiving from around the world. For example, uh, from the U.S., that the major and the larger banks they expect that fraud due to forged maker signature is either going to stay the same or is due to increase. So reason enough to dig a little bit more into check fraud prevention options and also into the methods of those check fraud prevention stuff that have proven to be successful. So first of all, a little bit about the challenges and the goals that we're facing. Preventing check fraud requires an efficient detection of fraud attempts. So as the result of our first poll has shown, the organizations in our audience have different strategies how to deal with that challenge, and uh, amazingly, 15% uh, currently don't have any kind of fraud prevention measure. So quite good reason to change this in 2017, presumably. Banks are under increasing pressure to make pay-no-pay -pay decisions as soon as possible, because sometimes they have to meet regulatory requirements, for example, check truncation introduced in the U.S. 2003 with the Check 21 Act. This becomes a reality in the Philippines this year. They are starting with check truncation. Customer expectations are changing, and among these expectations is an instant availability of funds on day zero. So the same business day a check is deposited. This leaves little or no time for those who order the tech and fight fraud, those fraud analysts. And they face the flood of items as displayed on this slide on the left, and they fight the daily needle in the haystack burden. In order to make the work of analysts as efficient and a little bit more pleasant, they should be able to focus their attention only on highly suspicious transactions. Dealing with so-called false positives, items inaccurately flagged as suspicious, is wasting their precious time. So one of the key performance indicators is a low number of false positives, and we'll touch this again in a few minutes. First, let's have a look on the major components of fraud detection, one of them. The whole webinar started with a forged maker's signature, and we're looking now into the science of signature verification. Fortunately, Quite a few one of you that are with us here are already using automated methods to identify not only forged signatures, but fraud attempts in general. 
The case of fraud victim Ms. Loguzzo, when a bad check was cashed with a forged signature, and the industry figures show the demand for some serious signature verification. It's actually a scientific discipline in which forensic experts specialize in. So it's not the graphologists. We are not looking on the quality. We're looking on quantifiable things. Several banks in the U.S. are leveraging automatic signature verification now for around a decade. Among them, I think, at least three of the top five. On a peak business day, signatures on more than 15 million checks are verified with this software. What the software actually does is to examine signatures similar to forensic experts, comparing various characteristics of signature images, like the ones you can see on the slide here. Automatic signature verification software decides in milliseconds after extracting and waging these characteristics combines them in parameter vectors, calculates using a neural network, and defines a level of similarity between the signature from the current process, the daily check, the gyro document, and a reference signature. Natural variations of signatures are also taken into account. So you can imagine that if you would do this visually, it takes minutes. If you do it with the software, it's just a matter of seconds. Some more challenges and goals around that one. <clears throat> Automatic signature verification basically requires two databases. One to handle the items from the daily payment processing, like checks. Another one to handle reference signatures and mandates. Who is allowed to sign for what, which time frame, to get perhaps together with whom. So depending on what you exactly want to verify, can be relatively easy or relatively complex. Automatic signature verification is, for example, part of a holistic check fraud detection solution, the one that is called COFAX Fraud 1. This solution sits between an imaging solution and the payment solution to support no pay or no pay decisions that need to be made for checks and gyros. Suspicious items marked on this slide with an asterisk and a warning indicator are excluded from clearing to be passed to trigger payments and passed to fraud analysts for subsequent inspection. What are they actually doing? Well, they typically look get with a given signature and the reference signature. A signature may be forged, it may be fraudulent, but it's one aspect. As we've learned in one of the figures previously, there are other aspects relevant to a holistic check fraud detection and check fraud prevention. Fraud detection and accuracy may be significantly enhanced if additional verification engines cater for detection of check fraud attempts. So there are five aspects we can highlight beyond signatures. The date, validating if this is within a specific date range, payee recognition, comparing payees against white and black listed payees, the amount, checking if the amount conforms to rules bounding the legal and courtesy amount limits for this account type, the amount entered on pre-authorized drafts may be verified if it matches a pre-authorized amount, the MICR magnetic ink character recognition line may show traces of manipulation, and finally, the check stock, if the images match against images of reference check stocks. In addition to these five points, an efficient detection of counterfeits, checks not written or authorized by legitimate account holders, is a must-have. If you remember the pie chart, 25% of check fraud in the United States are made out of counterfeits. It gets even worse if you look into the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, this major source of fraud losses has a year-on-year -year growth in the year 2014 to 2015 of stunning 41%. Looking down under to Australia, and we have Australian participants here in this webinar as well, counterfeits are the second most important source of check fraud losses. So if you look on this particular screen and identify for your own organization, where do you have to draw the defense line. What is 
your major attack scenario at the very point in time. There are correlation between these aspects. Pairing counterfeit detection with check serial rules further enhances and strengthens your defense lines against check fraud. So that's why we talk about a holistic check fraud risk scoring. The idea is not to have all these verification engines running in silos and have different sorts of results that you'll have to deal with. Something that we've established successfully back in 2006 is the idea of a so-called combined risk score. And in Brazil, for example, COFAX customers also have integrated a verification of the taxpayer registry identification number code, something not as relevant in the U.S. At the end, when com using in combination of whichever engines selected from above, these are partially selected from COFAX engines and third-party engines, at the end you'll get a combined risk score, sometimes abbreviated as CRS. Let's have a quick look into the signature reference database and why we are focusing on e-signatures in this webinar as well. One of the challenges to enable automatic verification of signatures and mandates is a housekeeping task. Signature references should be in good quality, up to date, and reflect current signing behavior. Electronic signatures, if they're based on handwritten signatures, provide an excellent option to keep this housekeeping task and to keep the reference database up to date with clean, crisp signatures. Taken, for example, either if a customer visits the branch or interacts with a consultant in the field, and we'll touch this in more detail very soon. So we've talked about key PIs key performance indicators, performance figures. So just one example over here. Banks score these performance of, of check fraud solutions based on KPIs as shown in this slide, and these are based on real life numbers from a large US bank. After the first year of fraud one in production, their false positive rate went down from one truly fraudulent item within 2000 that needed to be reviewed to just something like 100 items, and you'll find one fraudulent, truly fraudulent item. The productivity of fraud analysts increased by 40%. A total value of 4.5 million US dollars in fraud attempt was prevented in the first year in production. This changes a little bit over time in the subsequent years because there are changes in the fraud patterns, and so this number fluctuates a little bit. Fraud losses were reduced by 60%. So you can imagine that if something like 4.5 million of fraud attempts were caught, they started with something like 7 million of fraud that they had to deal with. The ROI was achieved within 24 months. In 2016, this particular bank added another level. They added payee verification as an additional module, which helped them to decrease the false positive rate by another 7% and enabled them to go for lower dollar fraud items. So let's switch to the next option for further improvement. This and other banks look into in 2017. That's when we are talking about electronic signatures. But before we dig into details, I'd like to pass over to Mike once more for a quick poll to see where you are standing in terms of e-signature adoption and e-signature understanding. Mike, please pick it up from here. Excellent. Thank you, Jörg. And um, here we go. So uh, our third poll of the program, as promised. So uh, the question is, are you using electronic signatures today? And there are six different possible selections here. I'll read through them. Yes, we do, and we capture signature images. Yes, we do, but we do not capture signature images. We just use click to sign. No, we don't, but we are currently implementing an electronic signature solution. No, we don't, but we are evaluating a short list of electronic signature solutions. No, we don't, but we are researching electronic signature technology. Or finally, no, we have not considered electronic signatures at all. Yes, and well, we'll see how many people say that. But 
Um, I will give everyone just another few moments to make your selection here, and then we'll be uh, on to the uh, final portions of our, of our program here. Okay, that's probably enough time. Let me go ahead and share results with everyone. And uh, okay, so 27.3% um, of you said yes, we do, and we capture signature images. And 16.4 uh, of you did say no, we have not considered electronic signatures. So a higher, higher level there than I expected at least. Um, but Yorick, please let me turn it to you and ask you um, any, any surprises here from your perspective. Well, if we look on this particular results, it's not necessarily surprising. And perhaps those 18.2% that are currently just using click to sign may have not had any kind of thoughts around signature images or even going beyond signature images. So perhaps a good reason to familiarize with options that you can really use in 2017 onwards. And hop over from this little reality check to, this is where 18.2% of you are currently standing and click to sign basically. Well, let's quickly walk through these options, how to resign. As we know in the US, the most frequently used method is this one. Typically you are keying in your name in a signature field on screen, clicking accept triggers the signing of a document, and the signed document displays the name in a cursive or handwriting font, maybe with some information about the e-signing software even included. For many cases, this method is sufficient and good enough, but of course, it doesn't help you if you have a check fraud detection problem and something with forged maker signature. Electronic signatures, well, for some use cases, you may want to achieve also a higher evidential weight of e-signed documents. If we remember what is in the US e-sign act, how electronic signatures are defined, they are defined as an electronic sound, symbol, or process attached or logically associated with a contract or other record and executed or adopted by a person with the intent to sign a record. So much about the act. Um, for example, another option to e-sign is really to take a snapshot of a signer ID, a driver's license, a passport, whatever kind of document is provided, government issued document typically, or even if you have an image of the signer itself or both. But let's have a look into what handwritten signatures can do for you if they are used as electronic signatures. They may be digitized throughout the writing process on screen and there may even be more to the handwritten signature than just a dump signature image only. So what we see here is an image of signing on an iPad, could be a tablet, smartphone, and some of you may also have some signature pads in place or interactive pen displays. Reason to look into this one a little bit deeper. In many cases you sign today, the capturing quality of handwritten signatures is unfortunately poor. So you may have the impression that your signature is not taken seriously at all. For example, if you sign when receiving a parcel at your doorstep, paying a taxi, or checking in at a hotel, What's important to know for taking handwritten signatures in serious manner and in a way that it helps to prevent check fraud? There are two basic characteristics of handwritten signatures, the static image and the dynamic biometric signals from the writing movement. For improved automatic signature verification in check processing, the primary focus sits on the image, because that's the one that we need also when we look on checks. But a quick look, because many people think, okay, so if I'm just uh, signing on a document and provide my handwritten signature, how is this protected against manipulation? Can this be a secure method, even superior to some click to sign approaches? So quickly, what's underneath the hood of e-signed documents with handwritten signatures. Using an appropriate software, they contain much more than just the image of a handwritten signature created with digital instead of wet ink. 
For example, COFAC signed doc is compliant to ISO standards in two ways. The green side shows you a little bit about capturing biometric signature data, and the blue boxes, they talk about how this document is actually secured against manipulation. The result is a self-contained document. The integrity may be validated because signatures are embedded based on an ISO standard to create a so-called signature object. So you can validate this with any standard PDF reader. And this is something that you ought to use when you, for example, use signature capturing for account opening, for withdrawals, for contracts, etc. So whenever you do e-signing, think about the evidential weight of an e-signed document. The other component is it ought to be a paper-like experience. So there are some differentiators to if you just sign with your finger on any kind of smartphone and you really do not want to use the signature for a later verification. Today there are many options for capturing handwritten signatures without paper and taking it seriously. One of the most popular accessories to the iPad are styluses. Some of them even come with ballpoint tips and are capable to capture biometrics of the writing pressure, something that you definitely can see when applied throughout the writing process. So there are various options. There is a broad choice of suitable Android and Windows tablets, tablets, smartphones, as well as signature pads, and interactive pen displays for in-branch usage. Likewise, uh, the ability to plug in different verification engines for fraud detection to calculate a combined risk score, as you've seen some slides before. Make sure that an e-signing solution is not limited to specific device types so that your goal for evidential weight can be achieved if you want to leverage this for check fraud prevention. Some other aspects are, to summarize this a little bit, it does not need an iPad Pro with a pencil, but it works perfectly fine with such a combination if you want to provide customers with a signing experience which they perceive as convenient and also as trustworthy, and which provides you with data suitable to raise the bar in your defense against check fraud. In short, for more than two decades, we have been taking handwritten signatures very serious, and so should you when it comes to check processing. So it's not necessarily signing with a finger on a smartphone that helps you that much. Among banks with assets of more than 75 billion in the 2015 ABA deposit account fraud survey, 37.5% are expecting an increase in fraud losses by forged maker signatures and 62.5% expect that losses remain the same on a high level. And we have similar statistics from the United Kingdom, Australia, from South Africa, even from countries like Mauritius, um, that forged maker signatures will remain a challenge. So, Dennis, May I ask you to wrap up now the value of e-signing in defending check fraud, the benefits for Know Your Customer, and how this appeals to generations X, Y, Z, even the millennials, before we turn to Q and A. Absolutely. Thank you. So let's take a quick, brief look at e-signature and check fraud prevention. So what are the benefits? What are the features and benefits of e-signature? Well, e-signature capture, it eliminates the need to archive paper signature cards or manually scan them and do an image archive. It can make signatures available for other authorized business units, creating more of an enterprise uh, archive. And it can speed up your onboarding process and improve the overall customer experience. What's the value add? 
it reduces the overhead associated with the paper handling. It shortens the time to service for the overall better customer experience. How does that help you with know your customer? In an age where identity theft is an ever-present concern, signature verification across the enterprise provides an additional tool to support know your customer objectives. Finding tablets have advanced beyond the pixelated terminals we're used to to have the look and feel of traditional pen and paper now. Companies have been digitally archiving signature documents for years but may not necessarily be leveraging them as an authentication tool for account opening, loan onboarding, over-the-counter withdrawals, cash and credit advances, and even employee fraud monitoring. Today's tech-oriented generations are ready and waiting for it. Thank you. So now we'll open it up. I think, Mike, you want to take over? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Dennis. So, yeah, as um, as we noted at the top, we've got a little time here for some questions. And I encourage everyone that if you've got something that you're thinking about asking, now would definitely be the time to get that question into the queue. So let me go ahead and um, kick things off with a question for Jorg. Uh, we are running. We, we are already running another e-signing solution than your Cofax SignDoc. Why should we consider switching to Cofax SignDoc? <laughs> Very good question. Of course. Well, the consideration of whether to switch is more compelling based if you look on product functionality, and um, there is a broad functionality not only from the SignDoc angle. So there is the image capture piece within a signing experience. Sometimes it is also driven by pricing models because some of those that uh, deploy already an e-signing solution and have this in place, they are not so happy with the pricing and licensing structure of their existing provider. There are other options when it comes to deep integration into different workflows and especially when it comes to working with the core banking system. So there are various talking points um, that may it's very valuable to pursue alternative options. And even if you think about in which areas are you already using your refining solution and where did you detect some sort of roadblocks? For example, in the in-person signing scenario um, with regards compared to the um, remote signing scenario. Excellent, excellent, thank you. All right, let me ask Dennis this next question. How does COFAX differ from other check fraud prevention and e-signing vendors? I'd say because fraud one is using image analysis to compare and clearing checks, to reference in images. So we're going beyond the micro line, as I like to say. You're looking at the check stock. You're looking at the signature. We can look at the payee. You can risk rate or use black and white list to to vet that that item and, and determine a level of uh, suspectability. From the e-sign end of things, the audibility of the doc of a signed document, DocuSign is not fully contained, and and we feel we're superior with on-premise capabilities. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Dennis. All right, let's see here. Next question for Jorg. Uh, here we go. Please comment on whether there have been court cases related to e-signatures, for example, questioning their validity, the duplication, etc. There have been several uh, cases even also in the year 2015 and 2016. And some of you may know there is an industry organization in the United States, ESRA, the Electronic Signatures and Records Association. So uh, with regards to which case is actually relevant for the use case you're looking at, in the end, it's all about evidence required. And if for the particular use case and the particular country, legal obligations 
were fulfilled or not. So this is typically a topic for individual conversation based on the requirements if you are doing e-signing in the United States, in Mexico, in Brazil, or somewhere else. So that's something we'd like to follow up individually, because otherwise you'll be flooded with a list of court cases and drowned in some sort of flood and can't identify what exactly is relevant for your business. Okay, thank the you The interesting thing is perhaps one note, the, yeah. the aspect of compliant, being compliant to particular uh, rules is an international one. A, if you look on a global scale, in Europe we have the introduction of the EU regulation. In the United States, for example, the TILA RESPA disclosure requirements and other requirements around contracting, around consumer loan origination, mortgage origination, typically drive demand for e-signing as well. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Now, I've got another question here for Dennis. How does your product integrate with check processing solutions? So, Fraudway could accept a variety of uh, check processing file formats for processing through the application and utilizing CRS, the combined risk scoring and workflow tool, you can create a customized workflow to send items through the various analysis engines for verification. Those results can then be combined and you can specifically identify the types of suspect items you want to route for review and decisioning. It also integrates with your banks or can integrate with your bank's return item processing system to help streamline that return process. Hopefully that answers. Yeah, thank you, Dennis. All right, let me um, ask this next question. I'll just throw it, throw it out to both of you. What areas of the banking and lending business do you see driving the use of e-signatures? Dennis, do you want to answer first from a U.S. perspective, and I'll chip in the global one? Sure. I'll take a shot. Repeat the question one more time for me, please. Sure. What areas of the banking and lending business do you see driving the use of e-signature? I think you're going to see e-signature equally driven across both your consumer and your business uh, lines of business, so the consumer and corporate lines of business. So when you look at lending, um, it can be a challenge trying to get all of the necessary parties together to complete the uh, signing process. And then you have the handling of all of that paperwork, and I don't know who's refinanced or bought a home recently, but every year the stack of papers that need to be signed gets a little bit thicker. We're, we're reaching the old phone book desk now. So with, with an e-signature process, you encapsulate that, you streamline it, you give the customer the ability to view those documents, sign them in, in a much more efficient manner, and you can send them that entire portfolio back electronically, eliminating some of the, uh, the you know, paper archiving. I think it's something that customers are looking for. Yeah, and beyond that, uh, of course, it's once again compliance, 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 and this is uh, from the U.S. perspective but also from the global perspective. So we do have that sort of uh, evidential weight around anything that's going to happen uh, in customer onboarding. So the know your customer requirements, dealing with anti-money laundering regulations. And we had several cases also with fraudulent account openings that made headlines in 2016. So um, it is really from at least what we see primarily compliance, even prior to, okay, I want to cut down costs, I want to um, be a little bit more efficient. The need for e-signatures is typically driven with this one word. Excellent. Thank you both. All right. Let me 
ask this question. Uh, I'll just throw it, again. I'll throw it out to both of you guys. Our largest problem is the acceptance of fraudulent checks via remote deposit. Is there a program on the market that has the capability of querying the issuing FI in real time for funds availability or valid account? Dennis, would you like to pick up first? Funds availability or valid account. There from the deposit side, so there there are there is at least one other product that I can think of that attempts to do that. Um, and I've worked with that work to uh, utilize their products, and they have a very good reputation. Um, it all it's all dependent on the collaboration of banks between the depositing and the paying side to be able to accomplish that. Uh, the larger banks are more likely to participate in both aspects of that, and it can work well. Um, so it does fit that need. It, it will not tell you whether or not the check is a valid check, but it can definitely help close the gap on whether that check is issued on an account that's even open. Excellent. Thank you, Dennis. Um, did you want to jump in on that too, Jorg, or, or is that uh, uh, nothing good from my end? Okay, good. Let me go ahead. I to pick ask... up some others. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just did. Uh, when you when you started, I thought maybe you wanted to say something as well. Um, yeah, but let me. We have a long list on the queue line, so that's the. Reason yeah, I know. <laughs> agreed. Agreed. Lots of good questions from the uh, from the <clears throat> audience. Uh, so let me ask you this one then: Can fraud one be utilized for fraud detection on their documents besides checks? That's something probably I can pick up, uh, also based on uh, historical stuff. Well, components from fraud one may have been used if you are a voter that done um, postal voting in the United States or in the United Kingdom, and you have not realized that your signature has been verified with the automatic signature verification component from Fraud 1 for exactly that purpose. So it's used in the ballot voting scenario. It's used, for example, when it comes to transfer pension funds in several countries in the world. So it's not only limited to checks. Um, so we're talking check fraud in this particular webinar, but it is used also for other purposes. Hope that answers the question. Yes, yes, good, thank you. All right, uh, again, everyone in the audience, thanks for, uh, for, for putting in all these great questions. Um, next one, how accurate is the payee module in reading the payee line? I saw really good, I participated in a pilot and saw really good uh, accuracy in reading that payee line. Um, the particular customer focused on whitelisting uh, low-risk payees in order to uh, really risk rate who the item was issued to. Um, and they ran, oh goodness, they were running thousands of items through the payee module and they were saving Really good detection rate. I don't want to get specifics, but uh, um, they were very happy with it. Uh, it made the decision to go forward with it. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis. And um, that brings us pretty close to the top of the hour. There, are, there are a, a couple more questions that were that that are, I think, appropriate to uh, answer individually. So we're going to do those offline. So thank you, everyone, for for asking the questions that that are in the queue here. Um, but we're just about at the top of the hour anyway. And um, I would like to take a, just a moment to thank Jorg and Dennis. It's been a great uh, hour of discussion. And um, you know, judging by all the great uh, questions we've got here at the end of the hour, um, d definitely something that resonated. And it was also an international audience, so it's a it's a it's a global issue that we're that we're talking about here. So, and thank you everyone in the audience for being here. We'll be sending you an, a follow up email in the next couple of days that'll have a link to this recording and that you can kind of review at your leisure in the future to kind of go over the material that we've discussed. Um, so please keep an eye out for that in your 
in your inbox. And with that, I guess I'll wrap it up. Wish everyone a wonderful rest of the day, and I hope you'll join us again here very soon. Thanks so much.